Well, praise the Lord, everyone. We are excited to be here. I think about two or three minutes late because um, we are trying to get our lighting and everything situated. And um, Myra was saying, hey, it's looking a little dim, but we worked that out. So we're not going to be long winded as far as this introduction is concerned. But I do have to um, tell you guys that uh, we had a wonderful um, experience today at the assembling, the gathering that we attended over at uh, Upper Room Worship Center in Parkville, Maryland. That is under the uh, leadership of Reverend Larry Thompson. And we have a relationship with that uh, place of worship. And we are excited um, to have been able to walk through the doors again, uh, to be able to hang out and see our beloved friends that we haven't seen in service for quite some time. So I uh, just wanted to shout them out. They are actually, they've been very um, active in helping me and uh, Thirst No More Corporation as we've been uh, renovating a church and um, purchasing a church and uh, we know that we're going to need some tables and chairs and school supplies and all of that. So I know that's coming down the line, but um, we're happy that they have joined together with us. And the church is in Pakistan and they've named this building of the Upper Room Worship Center. So uh, Pastor Thompson will be able to uh, know that he has a place in Parkville, Maryland and in Punjab, uh, Pakistan. So with that said, uh, we want to shout out Kim Griffin because Kim Griffin is the person who has given us our subject for today. That subject is uh, Romans 8, verse 28. So sh she's very specific. One verse, but I'm sure that we will cover more than one verse just to make sure that you guys understand why that verse is there. But we want to definitely shout Kim out for that. And guys, uh, this is the last um, actual passage of scripture that has been given to us. So um, we are going to start something new on next Sunday and I haven't figured that out yet, but whatever it is, um, we know that it'll be exciting. And uh, just for the record guys, cause I'm using a uh, external microphone, please let me know that you can hear us okay. So that um, we're not just talking and <laughs> nobody's listening to us. So with that said, I want to um, turn things over to Myra mm. to open us up in prayer. And she's going to go ahead and get started. And um, while you do that, dear, I'm just going to run. I, I need to pick up one other thing before <laughs> we actually get it going. So I'm going to leave it and them in your beautiful, capable hands. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for all that. You have planned for us today and this beautiful day in Baltimore. And I'm sure it's a beautiful day wherever you are, Father. We are blessed and highly favored by your presence. And we glorify your name at all times, Father, because you are worthy. We give you all the praise and all the glory that's due to your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I love the book of Romans because it has so many different uh, levels and, and it speaks to so many different things. I love the beginning of it and the middle of it and the end of it. But we're in chapter 8, but I went to chapter 1, of course, to find out who he's talking to. This is Paul, and he's longing to be in Rome, but he talks to, in Ro Romans 1, 7, it says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those are 
believers that he's writing this to, but he touches on the Jewish situation and the Gentile situation in this book. But when we look at Romans 8, in one of my Bibles it says, we are God's children. And another one, which is interesting, said, from suffering to glory. Mm. And that was interesting because that's the, the theme uh, that we heard about this morning at, at the church. Um, this young man was doing his first sermon, and he was talking about suffering. So we say, like, okay, we are God's children, and we're called to suffer. Yeah, it's part of the, the walk we have with Christ Jesus but it's suffering to glory. That's, I love that. From suffering to glory. And it's part of the call. But the first chapter, the first verse of Romans 8, we all who know the word know it, that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But we're starting in, let's say, 18 going on to verse 30. And it, it begins with, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And that made me think about going back to Romans 1 again, because it's basically saying that we have this expectation. And I think he's talking generally to everyone because it says in Romans 1 that everyone knows that there is a God. Why? Because it's he's present in our vision, in our hearing, the, the way the, the world was made with the trees that we cannot deny, no one can deny that there is a God, that there is a creator. Mm. It's that for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God because it's all around us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered, be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So right in those first four verses from 18 and 21, it talks about we are the children of God and it also starts with suffering. So that's part of the calling that we have on our lives to suffer to glory and to be called the children of God. But it's a process for we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And that goes back to Genesis because of Adam and Eve and Eve was cursed with birth pangs. And that, you know, it's, birth should be beautiful and easy, but it isn't because of what has happened by the disobedience of, of uh, Adam and Eve. So the whole creation is in flux because of that. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Being adopted is more chosen than being naturally birthed because Adam negated the beauty of him being created by making a decision based on, I think to me, his relationship with, with Eve over against his relationship with Christ, with, well, Jesus was there, with God. And now we're waiting to be adopted. And that's even more precious because adoption means that you were chosen specifically, that we were chosen specifically. It's not like, well, I'm pregnant. What am I going to do? <laughs> this is what I got. <laughs> and we should be happy about that. But as we see, some people aren't that happy about it and they, they don't follow through with the birth but being chosen the redemption of our body eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body because we need to be redeemed and we have been those who have accepted Christ for we were saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees 
But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And there's that suffering again. Because to persevere means we're struggling. Because our bodies are struggling, our spirits are struggling. Because we're being pulled this way and that when it's so evident in, in this world that we live in now, we're being pulled. We, we hear this on one side, we hear this on the other side, and each is contrary to what God says because there's no perfection in, in the thoughts of man. Mm. The perfection is found in him. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Weakness says, it says, <laughs> but we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And from, our, from that, I went to 1 Corinthians 1, 9, and it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we're called into, the fellowship of his son. When we're walking in the fellowship of his son, we're not distracted by what we hear in the right ear or what we hear in the left ear. We're walking in the fellowship of his son. And that's perfection. And that's Jesus Christ our Lord. In, he, in 2 Timothy 1, 9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. A holy call. Not you're, you're, you're called to this, you're called. It's a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time be began. He knew even before we were born what exactly we were called to. And I think about, that made me think, I remember when I was growing up, I wanted to be a te teacher. That that was just in my heart. And I was deterred. You know, I went down one road away from that, got married early, uh, had a baby, got divorced early, was by myself, basically, mm. you know, living a life, but not really being able to fulfill that calling because I didn't have the money to go finish college. I did a little bit. But God still had a purpose. And when I got saved some years later, what what did I wind up doing? I wound up going to the field, to Guatemala, and teaching and counseling through the teaching young children that had been physically and emotionally abused. So that calling was on my heart, but it was also the calling that God had for me to be a teacher, to teach what does it say? We are called. Mm. At the end of Matthew, it says, you know, to teach, to disciple. Because mm. that's what that teaching is all about. Because it wasn't about teaching A's and B's and C's. It was teaching about how God can get them through the suffering that they went through. How he was with them all the time. That he wept with them. He, he suffered while they suffered because of the sin that's in this world. But they were called out of that darkness into his marvelous light. And that is the call of all of us, not just those who have been physically and emotionally abused, but all of us are called to it. Everybody doesn't have the same story, but everybody has the same need. We need to be called out of the darkness because without him, it is darkness. But it's a holy calling. It's, not, it's, just, it's nothing that can compare to it in the world. It's a holy calling for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son mm. that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So many people talk about when I get to heaven, I'm going to have wings and I'm going to be all this. But we're called to that here. This holy God, firstborn, mm. it doesn't matter what we look like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but we will bear the image of him. We, we look like him. In the spirit, that's what we should be looking like. We should be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
and we would be the descendants of that. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. There's that calling again. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we're going from suffering to glory. Mm. And we know mm. that all these things work together for good. And what are all these things? All the things that we have gone through in our lives. My conversion, my, my, my depression that I had before I got saved. The struggles I had as a, as a young wife, not knowing how to be a wife because I didn't know the Lord. Not knowing how to, to walk that walk. All those things, God predestined to help me to be conformed to the image of his son. From that suffering and from that struggle, he brought me to a place where I could say, I can appreciate what I went th through because all those things work together for good. Because I had a calling on my life. You have a calling on your life. We all have a calling on our lives. It's up to us to fulfill it, to walk in that direction. It was my choice. It's your choice. Are we going to listen to what's on the right? Are we going to listen to what's on the left? Are we going to listen directly to the call of God on our lives so that we are called according to his purpose? Now, I remember, you know, the, the purpose-driven life. Is that the mm -hmm. name of the book? Mm -hmm. I remember reading it, but you know, I don't remember what I read. So, what purpose did it have? What I read in the Bible has more purpose than what I could read in the book. If the book follows behind the word, then that's beautiful. But it's not the word of God if it doesn't fulfill the purpose that God has it to fulfill. So if you can read books. There's nothing wrong with reading books, but it's nothing. If it can't stand with the word of God, that's what we have to be careful about. Be careful what you're listening to because it, all those things may sound good, but they may not have the same foundation. They may not have the same purpose that God has for us in our lives because he has called us and we should understand that and we should know, it says, and we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, to those who... Are, are the called according to his purpose. That is specific. And it means that we cannot just say, well, God called me to this, God called me to that. We got to be sure that the God is the one that called us. I remember being in a fellowship years ago and I was secure in what I was called to. And I knew that God had called me to forsake some things in my life and move to another country. I knew it. It was just because he, he specifically spoke that to my heart. But I was in a fellowship with people who were seeking to know their calling. And what was taught wasn't God. It was more the person's impression. And and I, I, I wept over that because I knew what I, and I didn't see it right away because it, it was good teaching but there was something off. But I noticed that when the person with, and I were together, she never pulled on me. She never tried to convince me because she knew in her spirit, I knew where I was. I knew who I was. I knew mm. that God had called me. And it spoke to her because I was moving in the things of God. So she never tried to manipulate me or, or put something on me that wasn't what God had called me to. And that's sad because you got to be careful. We have to be careful who we listen to because they are charismatic people, people who have that gift that can speak those words, that can, that can share what truly sounds, sounds like the things of God. But we have to be careful. And I say we because when we speak, we need to speak the things that are truly God and not ourselves because our flesh can get in the way. We can... We get some, sometimes we get too much adulation and like, oh, this person is this and you're that. And that, you know, that flesh kicks in and says, well, you know, I know this and I know that. So we all have to be careful what we listen to, 
and how we share with people. Because we don't want to be a victim, nor do we want to be the person that victimizes someone else. But we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. And even those, those distractions can help us to become stronger because we suffer through things. We, we deal with situations. And then, like a light bulb goes off, like somebody just did these. Right. I was like, whoa. And we know, <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, God had a purpose for me going mm-hmm. through this because I love God. Mm. And I want to do all that he wants me to do, not what somebody else has said. Not what somebody has whispered in this ear and somebody else has whispered in that ear. I had to learn that. And I learned that through suffering because I did some things myself. Working with these children, I could see potential. And I would sometimes say, you know, I see this potential in them. And it was the wrong time to share that because it went to their heads and not to their hearts. So we all can make mistakes, but thank God he can change anything. He can take anything that looks wrong and make something good out of it. We go back to Joseph. You know, the enemy may have a purpose, but God can take that purpose and make it into something good. So I just thank God how he anoints us in the suffering. Because you say, I'm anointed by God. But some of that anointing is not so much for us to shine. It's for us to, to really drink in the things of the Spirit, which is for our growth. Not for us to show forth who we are in Christ. But to help us to become who God has called us to be in Him. That His light will shine through us to others. So I just thank God for the scripture because the Romans, like I said, I love Romans. There's so much in Romans to teach us, to show us how we are who we are and how God has taken that, the foolish things, and enabled us because of our foolishness to understand the simple things, that we don't become so high-minded that we can't be taught that we can't understand the things that he's saying because like a child, we're children of God. And we sit at his feet saying, Abba, Father, you know, we want to be all that he wants us to be, but we have to be careful that we don't go to the right or go to the left, but that we stay in direct communion with him and continue loving God and allowing him to work through the call in our lives, that his name will be glorified. Amen. Well, I tell you, dear, you're like fine wine. It just, (laughs) you know, every um, time that you share these days, it's just like I'm picking up so many um, wonderful nuggets. And and she is actually correct. I thought it was actually very interesting that the young man, I believe his first name was Antoine, um, who gave the word this morning, focused on that word suffering. Mm-hmm. Because throughout Romans 8, it, it speaks to that. It speaks to the groanings and mm-hmm. uh, suffering that we as believers have to go through. And Um, when the young man was sharing, um, he related, you know, his own personal testimony within Mm -hmm. the, uh, the scriptures that, um, was so interesting because he equated it to them moving, you know, moving from one, uh, residence to another and just, you know, some of the things that went on with that. And, um... I thought it was a pretty interesting approach that at the end of the day, and hopefully I'll say it the way he said it, but he said that it's it's only in our suffering that Christ is revealed. Mm-hmm. It, it was something like that, and, and that's uh, what really caught my attention because it's true. He, he went on to say, hey, when everything is going great and everything is peace <laughs> and love, you tend to not really consider God at all. But 
in those times of need, those times of peril, those times of wanting, oh yeah, we we know how to call on the Lord and we <laughs> don't like to suffer, but it's a requirement. And, you know, the scriptures tell us that we're to have uh, that fellowship in his suffering. Mm -hmm. So we, Admira said it uh, too, that, you know, we begin to look like him. And I, I want to make sure y'all understand, <laughs> look like Christ, that is. And I, I want you all to understand, that's not about, okay, now my physical features look <laughs> like him. No, what she's saying is that you then have a presence, your impact, your your anointing looks like that of the Christ. We will never be him. Let's not get it twisted. But we begin to take on the nature of those who we follow. That's why it's so important not to follow after any old doctrine mm -hmm. because you then take on the nature that and we are all really chameleons. We become a product of our environment. Mm -hmm. If our environment is always stale, then we, in fact, become stale. Hey, Talita, good to see you. We were talking about you yesterday, by the way. You know, I went to see my auntie and I saw your best friend, Day. So just know that uh, we had you in our thoughts and uh, we love you very, very much. But anyway, so, you know, if you hang around people that are pursuing Christ, it's going to rub off on you. Mm -hmm. If you hang out with people that don't care about Christ, that just want to get high and be stupid, unfortunately, that's how you will end up as well. So um, thank you, Myra, for, you know, just bringing that all in to Romans. And I, I'm going to continue with this theme and I'm going to be a little academic uh, because Myra is always accusing me of being a teacher and I'm always refuting that. I'm not a teacher. OK, but um, I do have teachable moments. So the first thing that we want to do is just to break it all down, because Sometimes we just dive into these scriptures and we don't know what's going on. We don't know why it was written. But Myra, she set us up really good because Paul had a major desire to actually get to Rome. And uh, through that process, he was actually, Rome Rome was actually just kind of like the, the, the middle, middle ground for his real mission was, to really go to Spain, but he had this stopover in Rome. Now, what uh, the history will tell you is that he had written this letter to the Romans and it was sent by way of Phoebe. If you all know who Phoebe is, she's uh, actually described as a, a deacon. You'll see in the scriptures She's called a Sakur. I believe that's how you pronounce it. But basically, she's just a helper, an assistant. And she had the honor of actually reading the letter to those mm -hmm. in Rome. So, you know, this is, this is an awesome way to set things up because Paul's desire and heart was for this particular part of the world, partly because uh, it's believed that he felt like he had kind of neglected them a little bit and that he had been really delayed in his uh, going to that area. And, you know, when you're when when the leader's not around, there gets to be murmuring and there gets to be dissension. And some of these things were rearing their their ugly head up in Rome. And so Paul's mission and purpose in uh, cutting through Rome to get to Spain was to, in a pastoral kind of way, kind of put things back in place. At the core of all of this was a tug of war because you had two basic factions going on. You had all Christian, by the way, but you had 
Gentile Christians and you had Jewish Christians <laughs> and the Jewish Christians sometimes felt belittled by the Roman Christians. The Roman Christians acted like they were superior to the Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians were still trying to somehow blend the law with uh, this new thing that was called Christianity. So they're still trying to observe the old covenant law and still operate in this new thing that we call the way or Christianity. And there's just all kinds of things going on. And this was the atmosphere that Paul was actually entering into with the main purpose is basically saying there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So, so everybody gets to share in the wonderful promise of Christ. And I want to say this to Toledo. I want to say this to anybody else who's on there right now, that that promise is still here today. I find it very interesting. I haven't got to my points yet, <laughs> but I find it very interesting that Paul was addressing both the Jewish Christian and the Gentile Christian, mm -hmm. and he did it collectively. Mm -hmm. In Paul's situation, if you read through mm -hmm. the book of Romans, there's sometimes that he's dealing with the Gentile Christians. You can tell in the writing. There's sometimes when he's dealing with the Jewish Christians. You know, everybody goes to Romans 10. Mm -hmm. You know, Romans 10 was definitely dealing with the, the Jewish Christians. And we end up, you know, going to Romans 10, 9, you know, believe, uh, you know, confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that Christ rose from the dead. You shall be saved. Well, I want to tell you just this is not even a lesson, but I want to tell you it was important for the Jewish Christian to understand that that was more important for the Jewish Christian than for the Gentile Christian. Because remember, remember, the Jew was coming out of a situation where they only understood Elohim. They only understood Yahweh. And so now we we're coming into this new thing where everything is going through Christ. And as I said, in, in, for many of them, there's this tug of war that was going on with the old way of doing things and this new thing. And one of those things is to understand that Jesus Christ, in fact, is the high priest forever. And, and this is what Paul was trying to let them know. So for a Christian Jew to confess with their mouth, the Lord Jesus was saying something because that would, that would actually separate them from their own families. That would actually, it, it means more in that sense than it would to a Gentile. Gentiles didn't have the old covenant. Gentiles are just coming into whatever pagan observances they practice into this new thing without any real uh, adversity about their change in belief. But for the Jewish Christian, man, they're coming in about to be separated from their families for what, they, for what would be their faith. And this was a major thing to say out of your mouth, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus, okay, and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead. Remember, they were also a people that did not believe at all in the concept of resurrection. So all of this was contrary to what they had grown up on, what their parents had grown up on, and what their parents' parents had grown up on. Myra inspired me. I wasn't even going in this direction. But, but that's the importance of understanding what's going on. So sometimes Paul is addressing Jews and sometimes he's addressing the Gentiles who have come in by adoption mm -hmm. into this glorious relationship with Jesus Christ. And so again, our audience is the Jewish Christian and the Gentile Christian. And we always want to get into the what, where, why, how, when, as much as possible. So why did Paul write Romans period? Okay, so it was to address those aforementioned differences that I've already talked about between 
the, the Jews and Gentiles. We see you on hell. God bless you. That's our son, y'all. Okay. Uh, so then also to demolish ethnic boundaries between Jews and Gentiles to create this new community in Christ. Ethnicity no longer matters. Culture no longer matters unless we're talking about the culture of being disciples of Christ. That's the only culture we should care about. So another thing, because y'all are getting me, I'm tired. Let's stop this nonsense of talking about the white church, the black church, the Asian church, the the whatever, whatever we can call the brown church, red church, green church, blue church. Let's stop that because those are tricks of the enemy that keeps us separated. There is only one church. Now, if you want to say uh, a gathering that's mostly black or mostly white, that's the better way of putting it. But the church, let's not defile who the church is because the church is not a what. The church is a who. And guess what? The church is us's. Not a word, but you know what I mean. It's Myra, myself, everybody else, our son on hell, Dayon, whoever's with us right now, we are the church. You cannot go to church when you are the church. So I had to get that out. Then also to eradicate arrogance and superiority by rendering judgments among ourselves based upon pride and privilege but to proclaim the only judgment that really matters in this world, and that's under the authority of God. And then lastly, to establish faith, hope, and love as our response to God's gift of salvation through Christ and by his grace. See, why read something and you don't know what the purpose is, it's kind of like uh, trying to cook something and you just shoot right to the, the, the menu and the ingredients and not understand the process. So that's why I, I like to do that up front. So before we get to Romans 8.28, I just listed out some things that Romans 8, verses 1 through 27 covered. I'm not going to read all of the verses because guess what? You guys pull out your own Bibles, read it for yourself. But I wanted to just pick out some key points because again, we need to understand why Paul ended up writing that one sentence mm -hmm. in Romans 28. So number one, he wanted to establish that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So all of this backbiting that we do, we don't have the right to do so. There is no condemnation, and let me make this clear, among believers. We can definitely criticize the world, and we can definitely be harsh towards the world, but among ourselves, there should be unity there should be camaraderie. The next one, Paul is encouraging us to walk in spirit and not after the flesh. Now, we say these things, you know, we, you know, walking in the spirit and everything like that. But to truly walk in spirit means that the flesh has been crucified, has been mortified, in my new favorite word, eradicated. I like to use words I can't spell. So all of these things must happen to truly walk in the spirit. You know, we talk about walk in the light, the beautiful light, but we can't do that until we have eliminated the flesh. And, and it's such, look guys, it's a forever battle because flesh is always there we can't get rid of it. It's literally attached to us. But when we think more spirit, when we have people who value 
spirit. And that's the spirit with capital S, not the little weird spirits going around here. When we do those things, then we understand that the things that come out of our mouths, the things that we do, they are more in line with the word of God. Amen. Here's the next one. And this one is a powerhouse. Being free from the law of sin and death. And can I be honest with you? Most of us don't really even understand how to be free yet because we still act as if Jesus did not come and pay for every sin. He didn't just look at the sins that you did up to the point of your <laughs> conversion and say, okay, cut off point. No, he died for, the, <coughs> excuse me, for us, for the penalty of sin. And that's a key word to put in there, the penalty of sin. We, we were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. There's no way that we can get away from that. But what Jesus did was eliminated the penalty of sin and how God deals with us. God does not deal with us as sinners. He deals with us as being royal priesthood, chosen generation, peculiar people. And because of that, we now have a freedom that is not based upon the world's standards. Doesn't mean we do everything that we feel like we want to do that's worldly. Mm -hmm. No, because our hearts have been changed and we do the things that are consistent with the word of God. And because of that, then we have liberty because we don't want anything else outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the, the latest uh, uh, Tesla and that is what you desire and you're looking at you know, uh, positions at work or, you know, uh, being given the accolades for things that you've done in your community, for your talent and everything like that, for your singing, your preaching, then you don't understand what it means to be free because you're still looking to man to validate you when the only one that we should be looking at is God. And God gives a validation that's beyond this world. Okay, so next, because Paul is addressing a lot of things in these first 27 verses. The next thing is fulfillment of the righteousness of the law uh, being achieved in Christ. And this one is really interesting because you can tell that part is related to our Jewish uh, brethren because the Gentiles, they weren't under the law. So he's saying here that all the things that, that were hanging you up, that you know that you could not live according to the old covenant law, baby, you freed up now because there's, there's a new thing going on, new by our uh, standards. There's something else going on here and the righteousness of the law is real. There's nothing wrong with the law. In fact, it really does reflect the perfection of God mm -hmm. and what God would want for his chosen. But God knows that we couldn't live by that standard and he put that in, in play to help us realize we couldn't live by it, that we would need something else. Mm -hmm. And that would be grace. Nice. Forgiveness. Who Understanding and mercy. Mm -hmm. And that comes still in the righteousness of Christ. I hope y'all are getting this because I'm telling you, this is important because this leads into the verse that is before us. So, let me speed up a little bit. So next thing Paul wanted us to understand that to be spiritually minded in Christ and not be carnally minded. So in other words, let's flip what we've been taught all our lives 
which is all about us, honestly, to appease mm-hmm. our flesh, to appease our desires, our wants, our needs. And let's flip that and consider God. God's requirements, God's commands, God's obedience, God's servitude, how that all works for our benefit and how we actually grow more spiritually. Like, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You understand? We don't think like the world any longer. Yes, we're here in this world, but we're not of this world. But now we're thinking with the mind of Christ. And the more we hang out with Christ, the deeper our understanding and wisdom gets. You want to know why some people seem to be so far ahead of you? Well, I tell you, they probably spend more time in prayer, more time studying, more time uh, just being in active service Mm -hmm. unto our Lord. The next thing that Paul encourages is to crucify the flesh of sin so the spirit becomes life through righteousness. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Don't you not notice that everything is going towards that which we're encased in Mm -hmm. so that we can be liberated from this, what I'm touching right now, to actually embrace this other realm. I've used it many times where I go back to the movie The Matrix, you know, with uh, Keanu Reeves and stuff. And I'm telling you, I don't care what wickedness created that movie. There were God principles in that because within that movie, everything was in this matrix. And the matrix is just this computerized uh, world that we live in where basically everything works like it's Groundhog Day. Basically, we're all going through the maze each and every day when we're following after the word, okay, or the world, excuse me, after the world. And it was only when uh, Keanu Reeves' character was able to see, wait a minute, there's another thing that's outside of this world that I'm living in, something that is more ambitious, something that's more honest, something that will bring me to truth. And remember, truth is a a person, not a thing. Mm. And when we are able to be in that atmosphere and to know that the truth is Christ, it changes everything. It takes away the fear that you may have. It takes away the concerns that you might have of hurting people's feelings because of your faith and your beliefs. You become bold. You become like the lion, okay, that is aggressively and lovingly on call for Christ. Then it encourages us to be resurrected in spirit and no longer be debtors to our flesh. In other words, like uh, I think Mary Mary said, take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. Resurrection again was a subject that was really foreign to the Jew. But this is exactly what Jesus is talking about as he was resurrected from the dead. So must we be resurrected also, not that we died naturally in flesh, but all the things that identified us with this world must die that we may live eternally in Christ and in God's kingdom. So then next to embrace the spirit of adoption and not the spirit of bondage. Mm. I man, anything dealing with freedom and bondage, it it's like a, a radar for me. It goes do, 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 boom. I get it. Because I too once walked in darkness. And I'm not even talking about the darkness of the world. I'm talking about as a saved sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled, fire-baptized believer. 
I was operating in and out of my own understanding because that's the way I was trained to come to find out that there is something else that's going on. Mm -hmm. And this is the one time, and because I think my son is still online with us, I want anybody that is in a blended household mm -hmm. because either one or more parent is no longer with you in the natural to know that adoption is good, baby. Adoption into the right thing. And we are all, those of us who are Gentile, we are all adopted into the family of God. And that's a beautiful adoption because our privileges are no different than the Jews who were chosen into this thing. And in fact, if you really understand Romans, Romans will tell you that it's because of the Gentile belief in Christ. It will provoke the Jew to believe, to get away from the old covenant law into the presence of Christ. This is so critical to understand. I see you day on day. Amen. Amen. I cannot stress this more than, than I'm doing right now. Stop being worried about who your natural parentage is because the real natural parentage is Satan. So we all want to be adopted. Please, God, adopt me into your family. Because in your kingdom, there's no more stress. There's no more anguish. There's no more pain. No more sickness. We get to celebrate you every day, every night. Ah, let me come. Go. Okay. The next thing is to know that you become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You know how that American Express commercial used to talk about membership has privileges or has its benefits? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's going on here. Dayon, you said hallelujah. Well, hallelujah, because being a part of the kingdom has benefits. Benefits that the world cannot understand. Benefits that are not just for you, but they benefit those who are lost in this world. And when you come into the presence of non-believers, it is those benefits that God uses through you. Now I'm picking on Dayon a little bit because I know she's with us. So look, Dayon's writing another book. I'm going to blow it out, Dayon, sorry. It's called Step Aside. That's the name of her book that she's working on right now. I won't tell you the background of the book because I don't want to steal her thunder. But here's the thing, y'all. We need to step aside from what the world has told you is tragic. What the world has prophesied is going to end you and know that God has the final say so. If you're going to step aside, step aside of this nasty world and step into, maybe day for the fourth book, step into. You're talking about step aside, but then step into. And that would be the marvelous presence of the Most High God. Next, to have fellowship with Christ through suffering. Isn't that something? I've already covered suffering enough, so I won't, uh, you know, repeat what I've already said. And then next, to be saved by hope with patience. All right. And then lastly, to know the spirit, that is capital S, the spirit makes intercession for our infirmities according to the will of God. That's all of Romans 8, 1 through 27. So let's get to the coup de grace, they call it. And that is verse 28. Now Myra went all the way through, but today I'm going to just focus on that verse. 
Elizabeth Abel is in the house. Praise God. All right. So Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So guys, I had to do a deep dive into this. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, if you do most of your studying online, there is... Um, there's a, there's a program, I think it's under Bible reference. I think that's what it's called. Um, no, no, no. The one that I, I use today is called Bible hub. Now, the reason I'm recommending this and they're not even compensating me for the endorsement is because it will take literally every verse or every word that you are studying and it gives you the Hebrew or Greek for that word. So what I'm getting ready to do with Romans 8.28 is to basically break this out word for word or phrase by phrase. So the first part is, and we know. Now, the, the first question I ask is, who's the we that... Paul is talking about, and then what is it that we know? Okay, <laughs> so so again, because I gave you, I set you guys up early. The we are the true believers. The in this case, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Let's just say the Christians. My favorite way of saying it: just the followers of the way. That's the we. Okay. What do we know? All right. So when I broke this thing down, it comes up with this word that's I believe pronounced in the Greek, the idol. Okay. And it talks about seeing that becomes knowing. Isn't that something? It's almost kind of like, ooh, I don't know how to explain it. But it's seeing becomes knowing. Remember how I said how if you you know, stay in a certain type of company, you'll start to know things and you'll start to look like that. Well, that's what it is. So Day and Elizabeth, listen, when you are seeing God through the word, when you are experiencing him through the word, you begin to know things about him that the world doesn't understand. Okay, it talks about um, this uh, this physical seeing, which should be the constant bridge to mental and spiritual seeing. Now, again, that's a that's a worldly kind of definition, kinda, but ultimately, it just means that the more time that you spend in the presence of God, the more you know. And what they were saying is that we know that all of these things, these 27 verses that preceded this verse, they are saying, we know this now. We know it now. And now we're moving forward. All right. So, and we know the next part that all things. Well, the obvious question is, all oh, what things? Okay, what things are included? And so this word comes up now in Spanish. We say paz, that means peace. But here, paz simply means things, okay? And it means all in the sense of each and everything that applies. Uh, it, the emphasis of the total picture then is on one piece at a time and focuses on the part making up the whole, viewing the whole in terms of individual parts. So it's like what we know is everything that we read before verse 28. 
it, it, it manifests itself spiritually into something that we now keep internally within us. And I, this part, I have to read the verses. So this part comes out of Romans 8, uh, verses 18 through 23. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You remember that song that came out, Don't Mind Waiting? I don't mind waiting on the Lord. And this is what's going on here. This is part of knowing what all these things are. It's everything that you're dealing with in humanity. Wait upon the Lord and be of good cheer. Then it talks about working together for good. So obviously, guys, I think you understand where I'm going with this. What is good? Because Christ said that there's no good. Why are you calling me good? Why do we call anything good until you understand what good means? Now, good comes from this word, and I'll just phonet uh, phonetically sound this out. It's soon erge o. Soon erge ho. This is all Greek. Man, I was in it this morning. Okay, but what it means is to cooperate. Isn't that something? Cooperate. You know, we talk about what's good to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Kind of has that obedience sound to it, doesn't it? It says inherently or intrinsically good as to the believer. It describes what originates from God and is empowered by him in one's life through faith. That's the only good that we can talk about. It triggers off of God. That's the good. We in of, of ourselves, there's no good thing in us, but in him and through him, we begin to do that which he sees as good. And then it says, to them that love God. Well, the them would be the followers of the way, but now we get to the real part. <clears throat> Who's loving God? How do we love God? Because we just throw around love as a word and don't really define it. But for believers and followers of the way, the actual word, we talk about agape all the time, but the actual root word is agapeo, agapeo, sorry, agapeo, agapeo, okay? And this is that love that we're talking about uh, properly to prefer to love for the believer preferring to live through Christ. See what I mean? There's no love without Christ. You might have lust. You might be looking at your first flesh and saying, oh, I love her. Like I'm here, I love my wife. But that's not 
the love that we're addressing here, this love is much deeper mm -hmm. than the natural. Mm -hmm. it, it, it truly, for the married folk, it truly represents a connection that's beyond this world. Mm -hmm. Married people understand what I'm talking about. After a while, you can just look at your mate and you know what's going on. That's, that's the love, okay? Um, it talks about living through Christ. I'll give y'all, um, I'll read the, the references here, um, the scriptures, because there's two scriptures I want to lift up. Um, but it's embracing God's will, choosing his choices. Get that, y'all. Mm. Not our choices, choosing his mm. choices, all right? And obeying them through his power. Uh, so, first verse or verses, I want you to pick up on 1 John 4, 9 through 10. And I believe it or not, I'm almost wrapping up. It says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So you understand what God is saying to us here? He's basically saying we have no understanding of the concept of love until we understand the love we receive through him. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that kind of love mm -hmm. that came, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because we look good today, but because God chooses to love us, mm -hmm. only then can we then take that understanding and bring it to every relationship that we have. It lets you even love those who plan to do you harm. For those people that have been victimized and you wonder sometimes when they get in court and how the victims actually show mercy towards the ones who victimized them, that is the love that God is talking about. That's the simplest way that I can put it. Okay, and then also in 1 John, also in chapter 4, but at verse 16. Listen to this, y'all. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So you folk that want to, you know, have these political battles mm -hmm. talking about the hate that you have for the current president or the former president, y'all are not understanding what real love is. Real love is of God. And if we say that we love anyone, it's because we have embraced the love of, of God and that God is in fact the personification of love. Amen. And so what you say every time that you say, I hate a person or you call them nasty words, what you're really saying is that God, this human being that you created, I hate what you did. That's what you're saying. I know that you might think that what I'm saying is extreme, but that's what you're saying. So I'm never going to say I hate anyone. I might have issues with them. I might have concerns about them, but I'm not hating anyone any longer because I have seen people that have been put into my life, my life to do me harm, become my confidants and have become my friends in Christ. But if I had met them with hate in the way that they hated me, then they would still be on the outside looking in. Thank you, whoever's given us the thumbs up. This is critically important to understand. You don't have to like a particular candidate if we're talking about politics, but that man, that woman is still a creation of God. And we've got to respect what God has made. Mm -hmm. And we have to honor God 
that that, per that that person has a purpose on this earth. We got to grow up, y'all. We've got to stop acting like the world. The world hates. The world encourages hate. But God is love. And then it says, to them who are the called. So many people butcher this whole passage because they just talk about, you know, the, the first part, you know, that, um, you know, the, the first part of the scripture, you know, all things work together for good. Can I be honest? My wife says that sometimes. And I always say, you got to cap it off. You got to give all of it. Because the problem is, is that the world only hears the first part of that. And so, oh, all things work together for good. So I can be a whore and it's going to work together for good. <laughs> I can be hostile and it's all going to work together for good. That's how the world hears that. But what they don't hear is for those who love God and to them who are the called. Everybody ain't called, y'all. Mm -hmm. People that profess Christianity, everybody ain't called. So you better understand, and being in spirit with God, he will reveal who's who. You don't have to point them out. You will know, and you will stop listening to them, and you will turn people away from those kind of people. Thank you, Dayon. Amen. Amen. And we will embrace those who are out here on this battlefield and doing the things that promote the kingdom of God. So I, this is going to be the last part and then I'm done. But listen to this. I got this from Living Stream Ministries. I don't want to take credit for it. Hmm. I read it and I said, oh, wow. So listen, it says, God's eternal purpose by definition is something eternal. It was conceived by God in Christ in eternity past. Y'all know that word predestined, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. With the intent to work out something that will remain in eternity future. So God's purpose is the eternal plan of God made in eternity past with a particular intent. It was made in eternity past and it will be carried out in time and the results will stand forever in eternity future. God's eternal purpose is closely related to God's will. God's will simply stated is what God wants. Listen, y'all, what God intends, what God desires. God's purpose is God's plan according to his will. God wants something to attain what he wants he has a plan that is according to what he wants, according to his will. This plan of God that is according to the will of God is what the Bible calls the eternal purpose of God. God as a God of purpose is surely determined to fulfill his purpose. God is absolute when he wills to do something, when he resolves to do something, he will surely do it. God's purpose is God's purpose of full determination in his plan. Now, I want to tell you why I snipped that out and didn't want to paraphrase it in any way. Because what this is saying, y'all, we have a habit of thinking that somehow God's will has something to do with us. 
God's will is not based upon our desires. God's will is not based upon what we want. God's will is his will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God does not have to reveal his will. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? God just has a purpose. He had a, he had a purpose for creating all of this to begin with. He had a purpose for allowing the serpent to tempt us. He had a plan in place. It wasn't a plan that he made up on the spot. He had this plan already. And this plan that he had for us is God's plan. Stop trying to figure out the plan and live within the plan. And be a part of his perfect, perfect will. His intent, which is eternity. It has an eternal purpose. God's will. It's a, it doesn't say anything in that description about how it relates to us. Because our will, get it y'all, last point. Our will is to be in his will. Bottom line, that's his will. He doesn't have to give it to us. He doesn't have to define it. It just is. God is and so shall we be in him. That's the message for today. Amen. That's it. Kim Griffin, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Stop, guys, stop looking always to how God relates to what you want. That's the whole problem with all of this. I want, I want, mm. I want, I desire. Yes, he'll do it. But according to his will, honestly, because I had this uh, talk with my cousin last night. Hey, it might not be his will for you to be healed. At some point, there's going to be an illness or something mm -hmm. and you're going to leave this earth. God determines that date. He determines how much affliction you might have to go through in order to realize that this never had anything to do with you because it's his will. So with that said, I hope that between Myra and I, mm -hmm. that you got a little bit more of an understanding of that one verse, <laughs> that one verse and why it's so critical and why it's so important to get to that point before you go to the next stage where Myra already took us. She went beyond that. And that is even more incredible. Um, but guys, Myra, is there anything else you need to share? No, I just want to reiterate Second Timothy, which you said, reading that um, clip you, you took out, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amen. 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 And today on, we love you too. Um, we just love the compliments that are, are given online. It really encourages us. So thank you for that. Um, uh, we spent time with uh, Dayon and uh, her husband, Quentin and, my aunt Landonia, and we all just hung out together, you know, doing what we do, sitting at the table. By the way, that's what we call church, y'all, and just <laughs> talking about the Lord and other things and glorifying him. That's the real uh, ecclesia, the real church. And we pray that today, even though we might not be physically in your homes, that, again, you've had this wonderful time being in the assembly of saints with us. God bless and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. Amen and good day. <laughs>